Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Jordan Bateman, Vice President, Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association in BC. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Jim. Jordan, uh, we'll let you get a little rant off your chest right off the top here. The Agricultural Reserve Commission shutting down some pretty important festivals that a lot of people look forward to. Yeah, the ALC, uh, which manages the uh, Agricultural Land Reserve, which was set up in the 1970s and for some reason has become uh, sacred ground that cannot possibly be touched for anything else, uh, they are cracking down on various events. And we first saw it in my hometown of Langley, where a very popular Christmas festival that took place during, uh, obviously, non-growing season, uh, off-peak times uh, on a farm, um, they uh, it drew you know thousands and thousands of people to uh, a Christmas festival every year. They sold poinsettias and things like that, but you know also uh, different craft products and farm products uh, through a market, hugely popular. The ALC essentially shut them down, said uh, no, you, that is not a farm use. You're not allowed to do that, even though it generated revenue for the farm and kind of helped subsidize their operations uh, throughout the year. This was bad enough. Uh, that event now has had to move to Tradex in Abbotsford. But just this week, we find out that a very popular hops festival, so hops being a key ingredient, of course, in many craft beers, this hops festival that's been going on in Abbotsford for a few years, it has been kicked off its farm um, and told to uh, find uh, somewhere else to go, um, <laughs> even though it's obviously promoting a BC farm product. So this AL Agricultural Land Commission and the very narrow ways in which they're uh, defining farm usage, uh, it is you know absolutely gutting uh, the very industry is meant to help. Uh, you know, they should be doing whatever it takes to find ways to help uh, farmers generate revenue in as many different ways as possible. Uh, certainly, a hops festival and, and uh, you know off-season uh, usage. Um, you know, I think it makes sense to allow those to continue, but that's not how it is in the NDP's agricultural land reserve. Well, I thought hops was uh, an agricultural product that's actually in trouble in BC, with the number of hops farmers uh, actually falling. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So about a third have gone out of business in the past couple of years. There used to be 30 hops farmers around the province. Now there's only 20. Uh, you're seeing consolidation of those operations. Um, so instead of doing whatever it takes to kind of encourage, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, craft beer is becoming uh, a larger and larger industry. Why not try to encourage it any way you can? One of the best ways to do that is to have, you know, locally grown hops that you can use as the, uh, uh, you know, you can use in your mix. Um, that does not seem to matter to the Agricultural Land Commission. And I find it very perplexing. Like, you know, it's, it's no secret that for a lot of farms, the most stable revenue stream they have, you know, the most stable crop they have is the cell phone tower, right? You know, the Agricultural Land Reserve a long time ago uh, allowed uh, cell phone towers to be positioned uh, in uh, on farmland. Um, this has proven to be a very steady revenue stream for many farmers that's helped them get through good seasons and, and bad seasons. Um, it's not, farming is not a... You know, straight line business is not, you know, you can't count on because you made a profit last year that you'll make that profit plus 5% or 7% more next year. Uh, it goes up and down with weather and a bunch of other factors. Um, you know, why aren't we doing whatever it takes to make sure that these farms have, you know, stable revenue sources they can count on so they continue to expand their operations? Is the land commission independent or is it something the government can influence? Oh, the government can influence it. Look, uh, the government, <laughs> when the BC Liberals were in charge, these kind of events started um, you know, very clearly. Uh, if they did violate the rules, they were sort of given a blind eye to allow it to continue. It's only since the NDP have come to power and their very rigid, um, almost religious fervor for the ALC, the Agricultural Land Reserve, it's only since uh, Lana Popham took over the file that 
these things have been happening. So very discouraging, uh, discouraging from a community perspective, discouraging, you know, for us, uh, you know, as parents, you know, you take your kids out to a Christmas light display on a farm, they see a little bit of the farm operations, they, you know, get to, you know, meet the people who run the farm, uh, they, they understand it, um, you know, it becomes part of that kind of cultural community tradition, and now, uh, you know, it's chased out to just another warehouse, um, <laughs> perplexingly at, at, a, at an airport, it's not even an aviation use, but there it is. It'll be at the Trade X next year. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. Grand Portage Resources Herbert Gold Project in Southeast Alaska highlights increased gold resource, indicated and inferred, of 860,000 ounces, in excess of 10 grams per ton gold. Expansion drilling is planned on the Herbert Gold property for the summer of 2019. Grand Portage Resources trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, the parliamentary budget watchdog says the carbon tax that Ottawa is imposing needs to double for Ottawa to meet the Paris Accord targets. Are those attainable and do they make sense for a country that has the coldest climate on the planet? Uh, no, there's no need to double that tax. Uh, you know, our, our carbon tax that everyone claimed to make as a world leader, look around. We're the only ones out there. You're not a leader when no one is following you. Frankly, I, I think that PBO is wrong. Uh, I've seen many uh, you know, credible studies saying that you would actually need a tax of $200 per ton, you know, four times what it is today. Think about that. You pay $0.10 cents a liter right now in carbon tax in British Columbia. You're talking about $0.40, $0.45 cents a liter in carbon taxes to make a difference. Um, you know, that it, it's crazy. It's unsustainable. Um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And frankly, I think Andrew Shearer is going to have a field day uh, kicking the Liberals uh, to the curb this fall, uh, predominantly on a carbon tax platform. Right now, BC ferries are charging a fuel surcharge. Do they need to, considering they're using natural gas on the biggest ferries? Uh, well, uh, you know, it's obviously more than just uh, the biggest ferries. Uh, not all of their ferries run natural gas. But prices um, look, have come down. Yeah, the prices have come down. It'll be interesting to see how long it takes before they respond to that. Um, you know, the the fuel surcharge is a, it's a good little reminder, right? Like, BC Ferries could just move their fares up and down, although they'd have to get provincial permission to do so, I think. But, you know, they could mess around with fares and, and disguise the cost. Uh, that's what happens when, you know, you go to the grocery store. You know, the cost of fuel to get your, your food to that grocery store are disguised in the cost. Uh, for what you're paying for the product. Um, imagine if Safeway and Save on Foods had, you know, <laughs> you know, a fuel tax fee or a fuel fee. Imagine how that would make us a lot more sensitive to the cost of, of gasoline and, and what it costs to actually get products to market. Um, you know, I, it's not great. You know, obviously for fair users, you want to have as low a cost as possible. At the same time, I, I kind of appreciate at this point that BC Ferries is at least putting it out there. And, you know, I wish more people would use critical thinking to think about what that actually means for other products. Yeah, I know the idea of the carbon tax was to chase people out of their cars and onto transit, but transit's boosting their fares too. So where do you say? Yeah, well, look, transit needs to boost their fares. They, they're not collecting, uh, I think they only recoup less than 40%. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the exact stat is today, but about 40% is recouped at the fare box. Um, you know, and subsidized by taxpayers who don't use the, the service otherwise. So, you know, it's, you know, you want to make sure that people are paying their fair share for what's going on. Um, but yeah, look, fuel is probably, well, I imagine fuel and labor are the two biggest costs for, for the transit systems anywhere. Um, labor is becoming more and more expensive thanks to, um, uh, thanks to the NDP's policies on, uh, employment and, uh, you know, Fuel is also becoming more expensive thanks to, uh, you know, restricting supply and raising taxes. 
If we had the doubled pipeline in action, would we have had lower gasoline prices in the lower mainland? Yeah, that's what the government of Alberta says, and you know that uh, certainly makes sense. Um, you know, you have more capacity, you have more ability to send refined fuels through, and um, you know, anytime you get more supply to a market, guess what? The price of that product goes down. So, yeah, even you know, five, ten, fifteen percent more gasoline coming through that line to us would go a long way to helping uh, control prices. A recently released study said that. Canada has lost $500 billion in lost energy projects over the last five years. How much has it cost your membership? Well, it's hard. You know, it's, it's cost us in construction jobs. Uh, it's cost us. It, so, you know, it's hard to put a price tag on, on that. But, look, when investment comes in in oil and gas, there are jobs that go along with it. Uh, you know, there's construction jobs. There's actually the running the plant jobs. There's all sorts of the indirect jobs, the induced jobs that come along. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not surprising that it's that much money. And you think about what you could have done with the, with that kind of uh, a kind of dollar figure uh, to make Canada better. Um, you think of the infrastructure we haven't built because you know we didn't have that money. And you think of the money we've borrowed in place of the revenue we could have gotten from uh, from oil and gas. It's mind boggling. So. You know, I'd like to see Justin Trudeau make things easier uh, when it comes to approving these oil and gas projects. Unfortunately, they've just passed uh, Bill C-69, which isn't going to make it easier. It's going to make it much t- tougher to build energy projects in this country. Um, and again, that's probably another wedge issue that Andrew Shear can make a lot of hay with this fall. Bill C-69, what does it do and what doesn't it do? Bill C-69 changes the way that energy projects are vetted. There's a few kind of glaring concerns, well, many glaring concerns with this. For one thing, um, they remove any kind of time limit. The government removes any kind of time limit on um, how long it would take to vet an energy project. So the industry said, look, you know, two years of vetting, that should be more than enough time for you to, you know, for the regulators to come to a decision on whether a project should proceed or not. Uh, nope, not good enough. They removed any kind of timeline restriction on that. They also removed... Um, uh, any kind of indication. So right now, if someone wants to go speak against a project in front of the National Energy Board, uh, you have to prove some sort of standing. Right? You have to prove that that project actually affects you. Maybe you know, it would run through your property or next door. Maybe your business would be adversely or positively affected. You have to prove that you have some sort of actual tangible link. Well, they want to get rid of that. And uh, this new law would, uh, would take away that standing test, which means anyone, anyone anywhere could speak to that issue. Um, the problem with that is, you know, these professional eco-activists will just filibuster these projects. And now you have no time limit. If they can keep speakers going, that project will never, ever be approved. So that's, those are the two big things. There's, there's other problems. Um, for example, they're going to consider um, a number of factors when weighing whether or not to approve a project. One of the things they're not going to consider, though, is economic benefits. Uh, they, they don't consider that to be an important factor in project reviews. So this is a government that says, you know, impact on climate change, you know, how it affects uh, sex and gender, um, positive possible alternatives projects, all of that should be considered ahead of economic benefits. We're not saying that those things shouldn't be considered, but we are saying, look, economic benefits has to be part of the uh, overall equation here. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, these projects don't even have a fighting chance. So it's a very crafty way of... Um, for the federal liberals to try to kill a number of these projects. This thing is reviled in Alberta. Um, it's reviled in Saskatchewan. It should be, it's definitely reviled among the oil and gas industry here in British Columbia. Uh, John Horgan has been very silent because, of course, he is in league with a lot of these eco-activists. But this is uh, definitely bad news uh, for the economic interests of Canada and for British Columbia as well. Didn't Trudeau say, how dare you bring up the issue of national unity when it comes to energy issues? Yeah, yeah, it's always convenient how Quebec politicians can bring it up on, uh, you know, any number of issues related to, uh, to the Quebec, uh, the Quebec law getting their, you know, more than their fair share of money out of Canada. But, uh, you know, no one else is ever allowed to mention it. But listen, drive around Alberta this summer, go for a visit. You'll see a lot of people very frustrated with the way they've been treated by Canada, the way they've been treated by Justin Trudeau and John Horgan. And, uh, you know, we are really playing with fire. There's, you know, I think a, a definite sense that, you know, maybe Alberta should go it alone. Um, that's not good. That should be terrifying for federal politicians. We need to take it seriously. We need to make sure that we're doing the things that, uh, that make things better there. 
Well, I, I just interviewed People's Party of Canada leader Maxime Bernier, and he said if he was the Prime Minister, he'd actually bring in a law that would force pipelines through to areas that don't want them simply because they're in the national economic interest. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't take much of what Max says terribly seriously. <laughs> I think uh, I'm not even running, and I have a better chance of being Prime Minister than he does. So, you know, it's, it's easy for him to say you got you got to find the right balance. Not every project should be approved. I mean, you want to make sure that resource development is done responsibly, environmentally friendly, and, you know, with Canadian values uh, with it. Um, so you, you want to walk the line there a little bit. Uh, but, you know, uh, I have no doubt C-69 will be a major election issue. If the Conservative Party of Canada comes to power this fall, it'll probably be one among the first things that they repeal, uh, simply because they've, you know, the federal Liberals have gone way too far. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman. Jordan, is it a concern that about a dozen or so BC sawmills are either temporarily closing or closing forever? Yeah, this is a economic disaster um, coming to uh, the interior and rural parts of British Columbia that we need to talk about more um, because it's just absolutely staggering the numbers. So I want to tell you about a little town called um, Vavinby. It's north of Kamloops on the uh, North Thompson River, and they have um, 700 people who, who live there. They have a mill, a Canfor mill. It's been there a long time, 170 jobs at that mill, I can't for has announced that it's going to be closed because they're trying to save a mill in another community, I think West Fraser, um, and so they need to uh, consolidate. That's one out of every four people who live in that town losing their job. To put that into context, Jim, that would be like 133,000 people in Surrey losing their job or 48,000 people in Kelowna losing their job. Um, you know, or 40,000 people in Langley Township losing their job. It's a mind-boggling number. And, you know, that town is, you know, essentially dead. Uh, you know, there's just no way you can replace that kind of, those kinds of jobs, um, that kind of economic activity. Um, you know, you think of that, those are the direct jobs. You think of the, you know, people, you know, there's probably a, a barber in town. There's probably, you know, a few small businesses that, you know, the mill buys products for or that mill employees support. All of that uh, will vanish. And, you know, it's heartbreaking for that community, but there's going to be a lot more of Vavinbees around the province as these um, as the forestry industry continues to struggle and as the provincial government does nothing but, you know, make life more expensive for employers and, you know, drag their heels on uh, meaningful forestry policy. Well, of course, they said one of the reasons is the lack of forest due to all the forest fires we've had. Does the B.C. government have a real policy to uh, prevent forest fires? Uh, no, they don't. Uh, they also, you know, it's a big province. It's a big province with many, many trees. Like, it's hard to really take that at face value. Listen, you know, there was the post-pine beetle era where there was a lot more wood flowing through. Um, but, you know, they've got to find, they've got to find something, some way to, to, to help with this, right? Like, in the Northeast, you know, we think of the Northeast as oil and gas and Site C Dam. One out of every five jobs in the Northeast is a forestry job. Same with the North Coast and the Chaco region. You know, we think of Prince Rupert and the giant port there, and we think of, you know, LNG Canada is coming, and, you know, the jobs will be there. No, you know, one out of every five jobs in the North Coast and the Chaco region are forestry jobs. And even down here, like, um, you know, even in the lower mainland. When I was a, a counselor with the uh, Township of Langley, I remember being taken to an industrial park in Aldergrove, Gloucester Estates, and I was taken to one of the largest um, forestry companies in in 
the province. They what they did is they took you know wood and they turned it into furniture, and you know this was a major forestry spinoff, and there was you know a couple hundred jobs there. And, you know, it never really occurred to me that the forestry industry had such a positive effect on even a place like Langley or Surrey or, or Abzer. One of the mills that are shutting down is actually in Surrey, B.C. So these aren't just, you know, these are jobs all over the province, um, tens of thousands of them, and they're all at risk, and not to mention the induced and indirect jobs that go along with them. So you know, we talk a lot with the uh, uh, Council of Forest uh, Industries, um, COFI, um, we certainly stand in support of all of their work they're doing to try to bring attention to this. I just wish the provincial government would take it a little bit more seriously. It seems like because, you know, the interior is mainly represented by BC Liberals that the NDP just kind of shrug it off and go about their business. Is there becoming a division in BC between rural and urban? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why it's important that we continue to talk about, like, you know, forestry may seem like a rural industry, but it has definite effects. Uh, in the urban areas, um, yeah, it's just it's so disappointing to to see where where it is. Um, we need to do better, and you know, wherever you live in British Columbia, you should have access to opportunity. You should have you know the ability to find meaningful um, meaningful work that supports your family. And you know, a lot of people have chosen to live in the rural areas for many reasons, affordability being one of them. And now we're seeing the jobs just begin to evaporate and very little uh, attention being given to it. So, so I think it's up to us uh, who are in the advocacy, uh, you know, the advocacy business, who people like uh, you who are in the media business. We need to be talking uh, more about these stories of these forestry communities and just, you know, how, how badly damaged they're going to be by what's going on. The trucking industry that's regulated by Ottawa will have to have uh, electronic logging mandatory in June 2021, is that a good safety measure? Uh, I mean, I'm not with the BC Trucking uh, Association. I'd be curious what they have to say about it. But, you know, look, safety has always got to be paramount on, you know, the roads for both the driver and, and other people around. Um, so, you know, I, I'll, I'll defer to the BCTA on that one. Jordan, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Jordan Bateman, Vice President, Communications and Marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association. His website, ICBA. If you have any questions for Jordan or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.